Hello, everyone. Welcome. So uh, I was supposed to be interviewed by a friend of mine, Kevin Roos, who had some travel issues. So I'm now interviewing myself. <laughs> and so I decided to ask the question that's been on my mind, my wife's mind, for, for quite some time. Andrew, how do you come up with such innovative ideas? It's like, well, I'm glad you asked. A lot of people ask me that. Uh, <laughs> So um, thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate it. Uh, how many of you know a lot about universal basic income? Raise your hand if you know a lot. And then do nothing if you know nothing. All right, most of you don't, don't know much. Well, you are here today, so you're what I call UBI curious. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I seem to be something uh, of a resource for people who are UBI curious. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my arc, uh, my journey, why I'm doing what I'm doing now, which is running for president as a Democrat in 2020. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, and then we'll take some questions. And then I'd like to reserve the last 10, min 10 minutes or so just to take selfies and meet people individually, because I think it's really obnoxious to be in this setting and be talking from a stage and then like dash off. And unfortunately, so ordinarily I stick around for a long time, but I have a rally in Austin a little bit later tonight. Um, and so I can't, because of traffic's murder and the rest of it. So my team's like, you must leave relatively promptly. And so I was like, all right, I got it. So we're going to take the last 10, 15 minutes or so just to schmooze it up. Um, so we've got, I guess, an hour together. I'll do my thing, talk, but not that long. And then we'll take some questions, have what I hope is a lively discussion and then uh, hopefully even meet individually. Um, so, so someone who knows nothing about universal basic income, what got you to come and devote a very important hour of your South by Southwest? You could be exposed to myriad experts from fields, uh, rain, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, why would you choose this forum? Like, what made you come here? Anyone want to just raise their hand and uh, say it's like, what got them in here? Yes, miss. I'm worried about people. Wow, I love that. What's your name? Yeah, so Polly's worried about people. Raise your hand if you're worried about people. <laughs> wow, I love it. This is a group um, that has your collective head on straight because I too am worried about people. I am, uh, the, and the numbers are more horrifying the more you go in. The deeper you go into this space, the more worried you get. I have yet to encounter someone who's a deep expert in AI and the rest of it. It's like, yeah, things will be all right. <laughs> like, that's not the conversation you have, unfortunately. Like, if you, they know a lot, they'd be like, yo, it's, it's deeper and hairier than anyone thinks. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. So, um, so I'll give you my background and story uh, just to uh, lead you in, on the progression that I had. Uh, because I was here at South by Southwest several years ago speaking as a CEO of my organization, Venture for America. Uh, so. I started an organization called Venture for America to help train entrepreneurs around the country and generate job growth. Because I was very sad, circa 2010 and 11, in the wake of the financial crisis, I thought one of the key problems was that we had so much energy and human capital and financial capital heading to Wall Street and Silicon Valley and management consulting firms and not building generative businesses in Detroit or San Antonio or Baltimore or Cleveland or St. Louis. So I quit my job, I donated 120,000 to start this new organization, Venture for America, um, and then I started calling rich friends and asked them, do you love America? And then the smart among them said, what does it mean if I say yes? And then I said, uh, and I said at least $10,000, and then, then 12 of them were like, I love America for 10,000. I was like, I thought you did. So, um, so I had a budget of 240,000 that first year. Today, Venture for America's budget's around six million, thousands of, Applicants, hundreds of fellows, generated several thousand jobs around the country. How many of you all like documentary films? How many of you have access to a Netflix password? <laughs> so there's, uh, so there's a, 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 a documentary on Netflix right now about my organization called Generation Startup that follows six young entrepreneurs for a year and a half as they try and build businesses in Detroit. So that's what I've been doing for the last six and a half years. Uh, and then in 2016, Donald Trump became our president. Uh, and I was stunned by this. Uh, I said, wow, this is a terrible, terrible sign. Uh, and I started digging into why he won. And keep in mind, I'd spent the last six and a half years working in the Midwest and the South in places that had lost tons of manufacturing jobs. And so I looked at the data and the research, and I found that 
we'd automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa, all the swing states that Donald Trump needed to win and did win. And if you look at the voter district data, there's a straight line up between the adoption of industrial robots in a voting district and the movement towards Trump. It's like a straight line. And so then, how many of you all work in technology or technology adjacent field? Like a bunch of you. So we all have friends who are working on this stuff. We know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we will now do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and the lawyers and the accountants, the bookkeepers, the radiologists. So Polly, when you said you were worried about people, is this why you were worried about people? People are having a hard time. Uh, and, and one of the messages I have is like, it's not immigrants that are making it so that people are having a hard time. It's the fact that we're making it so that human labor is less and less central to the economy. Where now it's more normal to have two, three jobs. 94% of the new jobs created since 2005 in the US have been gig temporary or contractor jobs. And so when I was digging into the numbers, I said, okay, it turns out that Donald Trump's election directly linked to the fact that we're decimating manufacturing jobs and we're just gonna keep cycling through to these other occupations. And then when I started doing research for my book, now out on paperback, more on our people. <laughs> but uh, when I started doing research for my book, uh, the, the data just got bleaker and bleaker around human beings. Where, how many of you knew that America's life expectancy has declined for the last three years? Uh, and, and why is that? Opioids and suicides. Uh, but both of those have now overtaken vehicle deaths as causes of death in the US. You all want to know the last time America's life expectancy declined three years in a row? The Spanish flu, 1918. Uh, it's an anomaly in a developed country. It is not actually normal for your life expectancies to go down in a developed country. It's almost unheard of. Uh, and so it's not just that. Our labor force participation rate right now is at 63.2%, close to a multi-decade low in the same levels as Ecuador and Costa Rica. No knock in those countries, but still not like where you would want to be if you're an industrialized nation. Uh, almost one in five prime working age American men hasn't worked in a year. And this is year 10 of an expansion. These are supposed to be like the best times you get, more or less. Uh, and so the data, to me, was shockingly consistent with a narrative of an automation wave that we're in the third inning of. Um, and the fourth and fifth and sixth innings are gonna be devastating. How many of you all have friends who are working on artificial intelligence or AI related companies, like most all of you? So there are some themes here. Polly's worried about people and a lot of you work in tech um, and uh, know people who are working in tech. And again, the more you know, the more concerned you get. The more you're like, wow, uh, do I think that AI can outperform a call center worker who makes $14 an hour? Yeah, I do, you know, most of you are like, yeah, sure, what's the time frame on that? Now, two years from now, there are two and a half million call center workers in the United States making 14 bucks an hour. What percentage of Americans graduate from college today? It's 32. Uh, so if you include two years in associate's degrees, two year programs, it's 42. So if you think about the workforce, 58% are high school graduates, making uh, typically between 14 and $15 an hour. So what you think about American jobs, you should think about lots and lots of high school grads. Uh, the most common jobs in the US economy are administrative and clerical work, including call center workers, retail, food service and food prep, truck driving and transportation. Being a trucker is the most common job in 29 states. There are three and a half million truck drivers in this country. 94% male, average age 49, average education high school or one year of college, a lot of them ex-military. Um, this is gonna sound very politician-y, but I was just with a trucker in Iowa last week, <laughs> last month. Um, I mean, I, I, I was. Yeah, why Iowa indeed, mystery. I'm actually going there again on Monday for the ninth time. And, uh, and, and so you look at it and say, okay, there are three and a half million truck drivers, are we pretty confident that we're gonna have robot trucks on the highways in five to 10 years? Sure, they'll be on the road. I mean, they're on the road now. Like, they're actually testing robot trucks now. Are you gonna have a robot truck maybe with a human there, like, twiddling their thumbs as like a quote unquote fail safe? Like, maybe. But eventually, are you gonna start thinking, huh, maybe I can convoy some trucks together, get a human in the first one, and then a couple of robot trucks following right behind? Like, that's pretty reasonable. 
<laughs> you know, and, and so, so you can start seeing where this is going to go. Dozens of truckers recently protested in Indianapolis. They did something called a slow roll, which they had a bunch of trucks, and then they just started driving their trucks slowly on the highway. Gums up traffic. What were they protesting? They were protesting the electronic monitoring of their driving time and work shifts. How do you think they're going to react when it's a robot truck that's actually taking their job away? I'm going to suggest they're not going to take that well. Uh, right now, the average trucker, trucker makes uh, a little less than $50,000 a year. And it's one of the higher paying jobs for a high school grad in this country. What's their next economic alternative going to be when the robot trucks come? It's a rhetorical question, nobody knows. Nobody knows. Now, I studied economics in college, uh, and what my textbook said would happen if you were to lose, let's say, four million manufacturing jobs. Who here studied economics? Someone did. So what did your textbook say would happen? Retrain, reskill, higher productivity work, economy grows all as well, right? You remember that from macroeconomics that you've got to be in? And then, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, I got an A. <laughs> um, so, so, um, so that is what the macroeconomics textbook says. And then uh, it turns out in real life, uh, when you go look at the numbers of what happened to manufacturing workers in Michigan or, or Indiana, uh, 40 to 44 percent of them left the workforce and were never heard from again. Now, how do they survive? About half of that group filed for disability. Uh, there are now more Americans on disability than work in construction. 20 percent of working age adults in some parts of the country. And if you go to these communities, you can see it. There are just a lot of people on disability. Now, are they genuinely disabled? Yeah, a lot of them had genuine injuries because if you're working in a manufacturing plant for you know 12 years, like you probably have something messed up. Um, but in, like, would they prefer to be working? Like, in most cases, yeah. Um, and so what happened to the manufacturing workers is almost certain to happen to the truckers. You know, it's like, there is going to be no magical realignment. You're not going to take 500,000 middle-aged men and turn them into coders or whatever ridiculous fantasy <laughs> someone is peddling. Um, and and, and th the other aspect of it, too, is that it's like, why on earth do you think you're supposed to try and turn a truck driver into a software engineer? Like, reflect on that for a moment. And the reason is that we define ourselves by economic value at this point. It's like if you don't have any economic value, then we have to turn you into something that does, even if it makes no sense in the world to think that we can do it. And when I went to Washington, D.C. with a set of issues, so you know, I'm a pretty cool guy, so like I, I went to D.C. and was like meeting with various legislators and policymakers, because I was an Obama appointee. I was an honorary ambassador of entrepreneurship. Uh, I have some stories to tell, but <laughs> what can I tell? I'll tell a stupid story just because I, I found it funny. So, um, so I'm in the White House with Daniel Lubetsky, the CEO of Kind, um, Kind Bars, you know, little snacks. And someone's like, I'm hungry. And then I, I kid you not, he like opens his jacket like this, like he's Batman. And he's like Kind Bars like all over. Like he must have had a custom jacket made with like eight extra pockets. So he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, and they're, they're flavors you've never seen or heard of and never seen or heard of again. It wasn't like, here's like an almond apricot. No, it was like some weird flavors. Anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> and then I was the only person who brought my wife. I was like, how, the rest, how did the rest of you stay married? Like, it was just weird. I was like, here's my comms person. I was like, here's my wife. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what are you guys doing? Anyway. Um, so I'm a cool guy. So I'm meeting with various legislators in D.C. being like, guys, what are we going to do? We're in the third inning of the greatest economic and technological transformation in the history of the country. What is the plan? And what do you think they said to me when I said, what is the plan? <laughs> There's no plan. <laughs> they looked at me like I, had a, I was speaking another language. The responses I got were, we can't talk about that. We should study that. And we must educate and retrain Americans for the jobs of the future. And then I said, guys, I looked at the studies. Do you all want to guess how effective government-funded retraining programs are? Yes, zero to 15%. Uh, we're terrible at it. And so then when I said, we're terrible at that, then the legislator would be like, well, I guess we're going to get better at it then. And then they'd just go back to their lunch. And I'd just be like, holy shit. Like, is this what passes for thinking, uh, you know, like at, at this point? Are we so far gone as a country that we're not even reckoning with the fundamental changes that are devastating our communities? Yeah, yeah, that's where we are. That's totally where we are. 
So then I go home, I'm steeped in this knowledge, this certainty, this dread. And keep in mind, I'm one of the most celebrated social entrepreneurs of this generation. I get medals, awards, accolades, like for being the guy who created thousands of jobs around the country. And I am 100% certain that my work, as proud as I am of it, was pouring water into a bathtub that has a giant hole ripped in the bottom. And no one's gonna do a damn thing about the giant hole. So then I went home and was like, okay, like what is the plan? What are we going to do? And I have two young kids who are six and three. And uh, so literally, like I'm looking at them being like, am I really just gonna raise them in this country that's gonna disintegrate around them and just like start trying to sock money away so that we can like have a bunker like some of my richer friends? Like is that really the plan? And that struck me as deeply uh, pathetic as a plan. And so I said, okay, what is the actual plan? Like, what am I going to do? And then I thought, well, in order to make it so that the people that Polly uh, is worried about, like that the people will do better, you have to actually redesign our economy. You have to like change the rules so that we don't value ourselves solely as economic inputs, but we value ourselves intrinsically. Like maybe we're worth something even if our truck starts driving itself or the AI is better than us at reading the radiology film, or you know, my mall closes and like I'm a 39-year-old you know, woman who works in the mall. So we have to start looking at valuing ourselves at some other mechanism than the marketplace, because the marketplace is about to turn on us in epic, catastrophic fashion. And so I was like, okay, how do you make that happen? And so then I looked and said, well, the only way to rewrite the rules of the economy is to get control of the government. And I said, okay, how do you get control of the government? You run for president and win. And then I said, okay, what are the rules for running for president? Only two rules, it turns out. Uh, 35 or older and natural born citizen. So I was like, check and check. And, and, then I, and I was like, and then check number three is I went to my wife, I was like, hey baby, I think I'm gonna run for president. <laughs> and then she was like, <laughs> she was like, that's nice. Like, you know, pass the sauce. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that's how I came to run for president on a platform of universal basic income, which is that we have to start putting $1,000 a month in the hands of American adults as soon as possible, which would enable tens of millions of people to make effective transitions. And as a parent, what excited me the most about this was that the data very clearly shows it makes children healthier and stronger, it improves nutrition, it improves graduation rates, it improves mental health, it improves relationships, domestic violence goes down, hospital visits go down. It actually just makes life better for people. If you're interested in female empowerment, there are millions of American women who right now are in exploitative or abusive jobs or relationships or are doing work that is unrecognized by the market. Uh, like my wife, my wife is at home with our two boys, one of whom is autistic, and what does the market value her work at? Zero, unfortunately. You know, she gets the big uh, goose egg. Uh, GDP, the same thing. When I know she's working much harder and doing more important work than uh, certainly like I, you know, like um, the average hedge fund analyst or whatever it is. Um, and so we, we have all of these perversions baked into our valuation of ourselves based upon what the market says is important or valuable. And so you create this universal basic income, which is not my idea. Uh, Thomas Paine was for it at the founding of the country, he called it the citizen's dividend. Martin Luther King championed it whole, like full on the last year of his life in 1967 before he was killed. Milton Friedman and a thousand economists signed a study saying this would be great for the economy. And it passed the House of Representatives twice under Richard Nixon in 1971. It came this close to being law. It's called a family assistance plan. Would have guaranteed everyone a minimum income. Uh, and the reason it didn't pass was that Democrats in the Senate wanted a higher income threshold. And then 11 years later, one state passed a dividend where everyone in that state now gets between one and $2,000 a year. And what state is that? And how do they fund it? And what is the oil of the 21st century? Technology, that's right. I've heard marijuana, I've heard a lot of things on that one. <laughs> but it is technology. And now I'm going around the country saying, look, what they're doing in Alaska with oil money, we can do for everyone with technology money. As a matter of fact, we don't have a choice but to start moving this direction because if we follow GDP and capital efficiency, we're gonna follow it off a cliff, which we are doing right now. We're in the middle of it. Donald Trump is not business as usual. Donald Trump is a sign of disintegration. 
and the disintegration is accelerating. You can see it in any numerical measurement. Life expectancy, mental health, uh, deaths of despair, like any measurement you want, business formation, marriage, child rearing, all of them. Historic lows, multi-decade lows, moving for a new job, multi-decade low. Pretty much any measurement of healthfulness you can find in America is at a multi-decade low or a record low right now. We are falling apart. And so this is a necessary, this is an overdue move. Like this should have happened decades ago, but here we are, it's 2019 and we have to make it happen now. So that's universal basic income. Put a thousand bucks a month in the hands of every American adult. Now some of you are thinking like, ha ha, that sounds great, but isn't that way too much money for us to afford? Who's thinking that? Raise your hand. Anyone? No one? Wow, that'd be great. At least a few people are like, hey, that's like $3 trillion. Um, now, what's amazing is that it gets actually very, very affordable very fast. For context, the economy is at, at $20 trillion, up $5 trillion in the last 12 years. So we're at like massive levels of wealth. Uh, and instead of costing $3 trillion a year, it actually costs more like $1.8 trillion because we're already spending $1.5 trillion on income support, 126 welfare programs, Social Security, and other things that end up just bringing the cost down of guaranteeing everyone $1,000 a month. So what I referenced before about this technology money, you all saw the headlines where Amazon paid zero in taxes last year despite record profits, right? And I'm gonna suggest that's not Amazon's fault, that's our fault. Like if you're Amazon's management team, you're like high-fiving, you're like, yes, another, another year of zero taxes. Well done, give those tax lawyers a bonus. Um, and that's cool, that's what they should do, that's what they're supposed to do. But what we're supposed to do is say, hey, we have to have a system that you can't just freaking game that easily. Uh, we need to get the American public a slice of all of that economic innovation that's happening because the trap we're in right now, who are gonna be the big winners from AI and the rest of it? Who wins? The biggest tech companies, right? You know any promising AI that's gonna buy anyway because they're worth a trillion dollars. You come up with a promising AI company, they're gonna buy you for two billion uh, and then just gonna tack you on. So the big winners are the Amazons and Googles and Facebooks and Ubers of the world, and they're great at not paying a whole lot of tax. Uh, and so what we have to do is we have to have a tax that they can't game their way out of. And so if you look around the world, every other advanced economy already has a value-added tax, uh, which is very hard to game. And so if we adopted a value-added tax at even half the European level, it generates 800 billion in new revenue, uh, which combined with current spending, all the economic growth that would happen. Imagine if you all walked out of here with an extra thousand bucks a month, uh, you know, I, I, I dare say your local economies would be a little bigger because <laughs> you'd be like, excellent. Um, pizza on me or, or you know, whatever it is you'd, you'd do uh, later tonight. Uh, but multiply that times everyone in the economy, you get hundreds of billions in new tax revenue. You save hundreds of billions on things like incarceration, uh, homelessness services, emergency room healthcare, and then you also generate hundreds of billions of dollars by having a healthier, stronger, mentally healthier, more productive, more entrepreneurial, more creative population. This thing will pay for itself. Uh, this is called the trickle-up economy from human beings, families, and communities up. What do you think? <laughs> the trickle-up economy, the human-centered economy. So that is the game plan. That is my plan to save humanity. And ordinarily I have a slide, I don't always have it, but I have like pictures of my family up. And uh, if you look at my little boys' faces, you will see they are not very tough little boys. They're very, very not tough. <laughs> uh, and so I'm doing this to keep the country strong and whole so that they can grow up not tough, if you know what I mean. Uh, and so that is the plan. Um, so hopefully I've answered some of the questions you might have had about universal basic income and the main idea. Big gist, if someone asks you what's universal basic income, you just say it's a policy where everyone in a society gets a certain amount of money, no questions asked. And most of the policies are around the same level I'm proposing, which is $1,000 per month per adult. So that's what it is. Why to do it? Because our economy is being transformed in ways that are gonna displace millions of American workers and it's already happening. Can we afford it? Yes. Will it cause inflation? No. Is it awesome? Yes. Is anyone trying to make it happen? Yeah, that guy. And, uh, and then now, hopefully, all of you, too. Um, so we'd love to take some questions from you all, but I'm going to suggest, too, the reason, if you came here because you're worried about people, you are right to be worried, because this economy is going to go from punitive to savage pretty quickly. The next downturn, the knives are going to come out. Like, I've been a CEO. You don't fire people when times are normal, but when times get tough, you, you like, just look around and see who's not nailed down. 
And even if they're nailed down, you start looking for a nail remover. So in the next downturn, it is going to be savage, and we have to get our shit together between now and then. Uh, so if we don't, if we don't fight for it, none of this will happen on its own. I've been to DC, I've seen the machinery. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about too. Like no one's gonna do a damn thing. So we are going to have to do it for ourselves. In entrepreneurial circles, there are two mindsets. One is someone else will take care of this, and the other is I'm going to take care of it. And we all know that this is something that no one else is going to take care of. So thank you all very, very much. We'd love to take questions. I think there's a mic for you. Thank you all. Hi. Um, my question is, it sounds a lot like socialism. How are you going to prevent that message from changing from your vision to what we all know is going to come? Uh, yeah, so I was asked that on Fox last week, and I said, uh, this is capitalism where income doesn't start at zero. Uh, and having money is actually good for business, good for the consumer economy, good for markets. It helps us all participate in markets, and I'm a CEO and business person. I love capitalism. Um, and that seems to work. Uh, I think it's something about my manner that makes me seem really capitalist or something. <laughs> where they're like, where, where they're like, this guy does not seem like a socialist at all. Uh, so that, that, that response has gone, been pretty effective so far. Yeah, the power to tax is the power to destroy. And you've weaved together two things here that are actually very different, which is universal income and taxing the thing that's working technology. Like, Technology is something that's working best for us. Why would you go out to destroy that when that's what's actually working? That's where whatever jobs are going to be provided are most likely to come from if you don't run it all offshore with your tax policy. Yeah. So the, I, I'd suggest that there's a monumental difference between a relatively mild tax that even my techie friends agree with um, and destruction. Uh, and so when I talk to my friends in Silicon Valley, and I'm friends with many of them, and I say, hey, guys, um, you're probably automating away all the major jobs. They're like, yes, we are. Uh, and then I'm like, how do you feel about it? And they're like, not great. Uh, and then I say, how would you like to take a bit of a haircut and make it so that the truckers don't necessarily riot and you don't need to go live in the bunker? And then they say, deal. And these are the CEOs of the tech companies. They are not inhuman. They're Americans, they're parents, they're patriots. And they know that it's a much better climate for progress and innovation if people actually feel like progress is working for them. So if they think that, I would say that they know what they're talking about. Hi, I've heard a lot of your talks um, about implementing this and of obviously the struggles are to get it implemented, but how do you protect it? Say we actually do get UBI implemented, how do you make sure that the next regime doesn't come along and rip it away? Because if people get that money and they start to spin it, they'll be spread too thin to live without it. Well, what I'm inspired by is the experience in Alaska, which is a deeply conservative state. It was passed by a Republican governor, and it's wildly popular in Alaska. So that's one of the great things about universality, is that if I say there's this program, and you're like, oh, someone else gets that, then maybe you don't like it. But if this is something that everyone is getting, as is the case in Alaska, so if you check out what's going on in Alaska, it's been in effect for 37 years across many, many different administrations, and it's so popular in Alaska, which is a deep red conservative state, that a majority, a vast majority of Alaskans said they would accept higher taxes to preserve the dividend. So if there's something, because right now, the, those of us, you know, liberal, progressive, conservative, we still have this sinking feeling that if the money goes to the government, it just gets sunk into some like bureaucracy and pipe and we'll never see it again. Um, but if it's money that comes into your hands, then you're like, wow, this is something the government actually did right. And then if I say, hey, I'm gonna take it away, you're like, what are you talking about? That's like the only thing you guys do well. And, and then everyone else would be like, yeah, that's the only thing you guys do well. Like it's literally like everyone's favorite thing. So this is what happened in Alaska and that's what's gonna happen in the whole US of A after I'm president and make this happen. So uh, I like the idea of a universal basic income, but my concern is that if I got $1,000 more per month, that I would start consuming more. And it seems like with capitalism, and you've mentioned economic growth quite a bit, it seems that it always comes at the expense of the environment, and there's a need for us as a society to consume less. 
And so is there any way that you've kind of coupled that to uh, your framework as, as a person running for president? Yeah, what's, what's your name? Uh, my name's Daniel. Daniel, that's such a great question. Uh, and so first let me say that I think climate change is the second existential threat facing us. It's like 1A, it's like right in peril, it's in tandem with uh, uh, the automation of jobs and the dehumanization of our economy. Now, I'm gonna suggest that these two things are linked because if you go to people and say, hey, we need to worry about climate change, a significant proportion of them in a country where 57% of people can't pay an unexpected $500 bill and 78% are living paycheck to paycheck, a significant proportion of them will say, I can't pay my bills. The penguins can wait in line or something obnoxious like that. And, and that's just human nature because if you can't pay your bills, you actually have your head down, like big societal level future oriented problems are not your concern. You get increasingly disengaged. You have what's called a mindset of scarcity, which has been shown to decrease your functional IQ by 13 points or one standard deviation. And then collectively, we have a much lower chance of actually activating around something like climate change. So what we do is we take the economic boot off of people's throats and then say, hey, we need to address climate change. And then more of them will get on board because they'll say, yes, yes, we do. Now, to your concern that we're going to consume more and it's going to cause more, uh, you know, I'm optimistic and we'll see how this bears out is that if you had a portable income of this kind, you'd have also more people embracing minimalism and communal living and going to places where they could have like a community garden and work on their like art that they've always wanted to. Like you'd have some things going in both directions. But the other thing is I wanna actually measure economic progress as I indicated before. GDP is an archaic measurement we made up almost 100 years ago. And even the inventor said this is a terrible measurement for national well-being and we should not use it as that. And so I was suggesting before that GDP is going to guide us astray. So what would guide us more appropriately would be something that integrates human health, childhood success rates, and environmental quality. You actually make it that economic progress is tied to uh, environmental sustainability. And then if you grow, you're growing in the way that you actually want to. Because right now we're growing in this two-dimensional way that's going to kill us and it's going to kill the planet. So what we have to do is we have to evolve to a 21st century economy that actually is driving things that would help us. And that definitely includes clean air, clean water, and environmental sustainability. Uh, hi, I'm an, <clears throat> I'm an American immigrant that actually now lives in Brussels in Belgium, and I've been living in the European uh, model for the last four or five years, and there's lots to be learned over there, imported over. But And one of the things that's uh, in the conversation there, and it's in the conversation in America as well, if you're paying attention, The Atlantic did a cover article on it to about a year and a half ago, which is just the end of work period as a concept um, in the first world. All the first world economies are up, productivity is off the scale. Um, Scandinavian countries are going back, going to a four-day work week and a seven-hour work day, sometimes a six-hour work day. Is there that what's is, happening to you, man? The no, Chicago I'm a writer, now. man. I just, I, I work five jobs at a time minimum. <laughs> I haven't, I, and I've been doing it for 20 years, so that's yeah. the, but it is, for, to be honest with you, I have a lot of people who are in the corporate world who look at me and want to make my 25,000 euros a year minimum because I have a certain kind of freedom because I'm not tied to that sort of economic model. But there are a lot of people thinking about first world economies moving towards this concept of end of work, which is deeply related to, obviously, also decoupling your worth as a noun. I am a writer, for instance, or I am a truck driver, or I, I work, and so therefore I have value. Just, and this may be you know, 10, 10 years down the line, but do you have any comments on that concept as a whole, the end of work in the first world? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately there's been this massive divergence. So. Uh, Keynes predicted that we'd have 15 hour work weeks because our productivity would just keep going up. Um, yeah, and you guys are laughing because instead we have like endless work weeks where it's like, I sent you a text at like 11.30, why didn't you get back to me? Um, so what happened in America is that our work week got shorter until about 1980 and then it reversed and got longer and longer and that's where it is now. Um, so in America you have this divergence where people in various roles are actually working longer hours than ever and then other people are just not working at all. Uh, and, and so would America benefit from curbing some of the excesses in terms of corporate work culture? 100% yes. I mean, studies have shown that a lot of those incremental hours are not actually adding much productivity. Right. Yeah. Um, but will that happen in the absence of some r regulation? Will people just you know, sort of move in that direction? 
unfortunately, the facts point the other direction in the U.S., where like the workism, um, you know, always-on culture is actually uh, getting stronger. And so, as president, would I want to try and curb that? Would I say, look, maybe we should move towards four-day work weeks for cer certain industries, uh, make it so that there are like uh, you know times of uh, the day when like you should not be always on, and that companies like should not expect most employees to like be available for like 16 hours a day and the rest of it. Yeah, I would. Um, but it's not going to happen on its own because unfortunately the dynamics of this economy make it that a lot of corporates will just demand more and more of workers until we drop dead. Right. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to change the topic a little bit because you're not a one note wonder um, and have, oh, I know, well, a you. whole slate of um, policy proposals that are quite specific. Um, and I know one of them is that you're not in favor of uh, free college. Um, I'm really curious about what you think about public education, K through 12, um, and what you think about the crisis of student loan debt, what your proposals are around both of those things, and also um, education in general, which seems essential to our civic health. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, I have 75 policy proposals on my website, so it's like UBI and then like 74 others. So. Um, that, that's what she was referring to, I, I think, in part. Um, I love the spirit of free college or free public college. I just think that it sends the wrong message because uh, college... So the first thing is that only 32% of Americans graduate from college, and that proportion has essentially been constant for years. And then as we've tried to plow more people into college, what we've done is we've brought down the college completion rate. Um, the college completion rate in six years now is 59%. Um, so 41% of people who are starting college do not finish within six years. And so selling college as a panacea um, is just not going to work. A and it's subsidizing something that's enjoyed by the top third of the population, which may or may not be the direction you want to go. So to me, you're much better off uh, putting a thousand bucks a month into everyone's hands and saying, if you want to use that to partially pay for college, that's great. If you want to pay for vocational, which we should be massively investing in, that would be great too. If you want to do something independent, maybe you want to start something, like that would be a better way to go. Um, and it's in p tandem with the fact that we have this educational school loan crisis in this country where it's up to $1.5 trillion. Uh, why has college gotten two and a half times more expensive over the last 25 years? It has not gotten two and a half times better. Uh, and so the reason is that they've just invested in a lot of non-faculty administrators. And so you have to separate out the different problems. Has college gotten too expensive? Yes. Saying, are we going to subsidize and have free college as a solution? Uh, to, to me, it's a little bit too much in one way and not enough in another. So what you do is you go to colleges and you say, look, why are you so expensive? You've got to get your costs down and you've got to get your administrator to student ratios down to what they were in the 90s. And if you don't, you don't get school loans. And then the universities would say, that's impossible. And then you'd be like, well, I have a feeling you'll figure it out. Uh, and then they would. And, uh, and then they would find that it impacts the student experience, not at all. Because at this point, the, these schools are like a massive crushing debt burden. It's like a tax on our economy. Um, how many of you all have student loan debt? You all look kind of young, some of you. Um, <laughs> yeah. it, you don't need to be young to have student loan debt. I had 100,000 in school loans myself. Um, I, I used to call it my mistress, because I was like writing a check to like a family in another, another part of the country, I was like. So, it's immoral. I would forgive a lot of that student loan debt um, uh, in an argument for stimulus because young people and like other people should be starting families, buying homes, starting businesses, and not paying off this phantom school debt that you know like was for an education they got years ago and the school was already paid. It's purely a financial invention at this point. And so, if you wanted to make an economy that worked for people, you'd just be like, look. This is a great stimulus to the economy. Let's just like get some of the school loan debt off of people's backs, get colleges more to be more cost efficient, and then give everyone $1,000 uh, a month and invest very highly in vocational. Because right now, only 6% of American high school students are in vocational or, or technical tracks. In Germany, that's 59%. What do you all think the appropriate percentage is for America then? 25 or 30, right? But the problem is we're overselling college to all these kids. We're like, hey, if you don't go to college, your life is over. Uh, and then they go to college, they get this debt. Even if you come out of college right now, you know what the underemployment rate is for recent college grads? It's 44%. So again, this entire like subsidized free college, like it doesn't solve the problem. 
Like, if you come out and you're underemployed and you don't have crushing debt, yeah, that's better than having crushing debt. Um, but, like, maybe we need to start trying to address the imbalances in our system. And one of the imbalances is that we're over-prescribing college, we're under-supporting vocational trades and apprenticeships, because if you're gonna automate away a lot of the jobs, which we are, 44% of the jobs in America are either repetitive manual or repetitive cognitive. We're gonna automate away a ton of those jobs, but you know what's really hard to automate away? Repair. Yes, air conditioning repair, <laughs> plumbing. You know, like it's very, very hard to, to automate away fine motor work like that. Those jobs are steady, they pay well, they're, they're gratifying. So we need to start saying to kids, like that's a really good way to go. Like that's a better way to go than a four year degree that might, you know, that just might lead you nowhere. No offense, I went to college, you know, I love college and all that, but, um, but we're just overselling it. So it's a very long winded answer to a complex set of issues, but that, that's, it's a multi pronged problem. All right, I want to preface this question by saying I don't know too much about UBI, but um, I'm enthusiastic about the concept. In my limited research, I came across two big criticisms, which I just want to shoot by you. And sure. See, yeah. Um, so what do you say to those who argue that giving everybody $1,000 a month or $2,000 a month would allow businesses to raise the price of goods and services and create a new social like norm? Yep. Or allow businesses to reduce wages and subsidize those reduced wages with this income, similar to how Walmart um, encourages employees to be on food stamp programs and such. Yeah, so if you look at our experience as consumers, uh, we have not had massive inflation in any category but three. Education, which we discussed, healthcare, which has its own massive set of problems, and so I'm for Medicare for all and just getting like the cost down and the access up, because there's no other way to do it. There's just so many excesses in that system and then housing. Um, so if you look at your consumer experiences with clothing or electronics or media or cars or even food for the most part, prices have been more or less stable. And so if I put money into your hands, all of the markets where it's a free-floating consumer economy with price sensitivity and competition among firms, you would not see massive price gouging. If McDonald's decided to double the price of its hamburger, like after we all had a thousand bucks a month, um, you'd just be like, wow, I guess I'm gonna go to Taco Bell or you know, the deli. Um, and then they'd all have to gouge you simultaneously. And then it just takes one of them to say, I'm not gonna gouge, and then they get all the business and then all the prices come back down. It's not like if you have a thousand bucks a month, you're all of a sudden like made of money. You know, it's like you still are gonna be bargain hunting. Um, and so that's true across all of the functional markets that you know, competition and technology apply to. It's really the dysfunctional markets that are driving us crazy. And putting money into people's hands will actually allow us to manage that inflation um, as opposed to cause it. Because this inflation is not being driven by purchasing power. In terms of the worker bargaining power, it's actually the inverse. Uh, so check this out. Let's say everyone's getting 1000 bucks a month. And then Walmart decides it's going to exploit people. It's going to be like, I'm going to pay you nothing. You have to work for free. Then people would be like, of course I'm not going to do that. And I know I cannot starve to death if you don't give me something that's actually worth my while. It's possible Walmart might actually have to increase their pay. What you might, you might see is you might see people that are frankly very unpleasant employers um, might have to actually pay more because at this point people know they can survive without a job that they hate. Um, and so you'd, you'd see um, wages change in different fields. There are some fields where they probably could get away with paying less, but we might find that to be okay. For example, nonprofits or like teaching and coaching jobs or some, some other jobs, they might be like, hey, we need more people, we'll pay you a little less and then people might be cool with that because they're like, I kinda wanna do that work. And then the really um, soul crushing jobs would actually have to pay more. So it, it's not a uniform impact, um, it, it would vary, but it, the big thing to think about is that it improves our bargaining power. It makes us actually more exploitation proof, not exploit a bull. Um, I'm interested in kind of two things. One is your definition of intrinsic value, and then I'm also interested in how would you plan to educate people on the concept of intrinsic value? If a truck driver can't be expected to become a coder, how can they be expected to become a part-time artist or an innovator? Yeah, so this is in many ways the fundamental challenge that we're facing is that 
people, actually no, men deal with idleness very, very poorly. Uh, if you're an unemployed man, you volunteer less than an employed man, even though you have more time. And you spend up to 75% of your time on the computer playing video games and other things. And then your drug and alcohol consumption go up and your self-destructive behaviors also tend to go up. Um, women do not have these issues. Uh, women are never idle. Uh, they find various projects and pro-social, go back to school at higher levels, et cetera, et cetera. This is shocking to zero people in this room. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's just facts. I'm a very, very data-driven man. The opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. <laughs> That's why I'm gonna beat him in 2020. It's gonna be glorious. So the, so the fundamental question is like what, how do we teach people intrinsic value, uh, to your point, where like if you're the truck driver who loses their jobs, $1,000 a month does not magically solve your problem. Like you need a sense of structure and purpose and fulfillment uh, and, and meaning. And so that is the fundamental challenge of this age, to introduce those things to millions of people as fast as we can. And these are some of like the deepest questions in human existence. Uh, and the way we get there, I have the answers in this book. No, I don't, I'm kidding. Um, like that, <laughs> it's called, <laughs> I, was gonna, I was gonna say something. Um, no, sorry, sense of humor. Um, so the way we get there is we put this money into people's hands and then a significant amount of that money goes into nonprofits and civic organizations and religious organizations uh, and institutions that can help restore a, a set of opportunities that allow people to find structure, purpose, and meaning in their communities and their work. Um, so there's no easy answer. It's a generational struggle. Um, certainly when I think about intrinsic value, I think about my son who's autistic and I think like it's possible that he'll never actually have like the capacity to have like a normal job. Um, and so that's what I think of when I think of intrinsic values. So you look at the person, you know they're worth, you know, just as much as someone else. Um, but it's going to be a very, very difficult journey taking the current conventional market-driven American mindset and, and helping it move in that direction. Is there a generational gap in people that are more open to the idea of intrinsic value? So uh, I think that the studies I've seen have indicated that young people are uh, more enthusiastic about socialism um, than capitalism, more enthusiastic about socialism than older generations. Um, and I think it's because many young people have seen the excesses and problems of capitalism over this last number of years. So I have a feeling that young people are more open to seeing people as having intrinsic value. I, I'd agree with that. Hi, my question dovetails pretty nicely with that, I think, which is that for me, I think the most resonant criticisms of UBI have revolved around the like spiritual and, and psychological value of work to an yep. individual. Um, and so I'm wondering what your thoughts on that are and why you propose a UBI versus say just a large jobs program with the same amount of money. Yeah, so, uh, so to me, work is central. Um, and the great thing about UBI is that it would create over two million jobs in these communities. And the example that I use is that if you can imagine a town in Missouri with 50,000 people, and right now there's someone in that town that wants to start a bakery, but the bakery is a dumb idea. Uh, but then I become president, and now there's another $50 million in spending power every month in that town, and then the bakery might become a good idea. And then that person starts a bakery, and then they say, hey, I need to hire a morning shift baker. And then you end up hiring people for accessible jobs in that community. Um, and that's only possible because you're supercharging the local economy and helping restore vitality to those Main Street retailers. So this isn't a, like, the, the easiest way is to say like, hey, what are the jobs that that community is going to value and support? Then people will do those jobs because work is central. The biggest misconception about UBI is that it somehow anti-work or mitigates work. It's pro-work. Like, it, it's pro-work in terms of just creating jobs in those communities that people actually want to do and, and, you know, can access. It's also pro-work in terms of, like, the moms and caregivers and nurturers because we know that's work, too. It's just our market doesn't value it as that. So that's the big, uh, it, you know, and, and that's at least starting to push us in the direction of meaning. How many of you all are entrepreneurs? 
So if you're an entrepreneur, you know what I'm talking about here, where it's like you're doing something primarily because it's important to you. Yes, there's money involved. Yes, it might seem like a good economic opportunity, but you're driven by the fact that you think that that form of work is the highest form of work you can be doing at this point. And so if you put more Americans in that position, then that ends up being like this incredible journey of self-discovery. Because what proportion of Americans right now do you think are doing like the job that they like, you know, really want to be doing? It, it's, so you said 20%, it's, 20, it's like, uh, you said 25? Five, 30. Um, it's, it, I'm happy to say it's around 30. Um, but that still means there's like this incredible gulf in terms of our potential energy and value. So, you know, one of the joys about this is that you're gonna end up creating t tens, hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs, and then people will be able to define their own meaning. Um, I think a federal jobs guarantee program is well intended, but would be somewhere between problematic and disastrous in practice. Just like, if you imagine a world where it's like, hey, there's no job for you, you're gonna die of starvation, but don't worry, we've got this government job for you. And then you show up, and then let's say it's like, you don't like the job, you don't like your boss, like, you know, like that there are some problems. It's like, well, you don't have a choice because this is your only means of survival. Um, you know, and, and so then you wind up with this bureaucracy, like doling out subsistence jobs that are necessary for people to survive. And then you have people get politically activated around that. Like this, this is a sure path to dystopia. And unfortunately, that seems to be the direction we're trending. Um, so I love the spirit of a federal jobs guarantee. If we could all magically have jobs that worked out and that we liked and that helped make the earth more sustainable, like that would be great. But in practice, that stuff is going to be very, very difficult and expensive and cumbersome and give rise to a whole new army of bureaucrats who measure our performance. Hi. <clears throat> 10 minutes in terms of the whole thing? Okay, thank you, Luke. Um, all right, last question and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come down and say hello. So make it good. Sure, I'll try. Uh, hi, Andrew. Uh, we, we all understand the importance of the tech industry for the future of work and how there's a huge potential for the, actually the tech industry fund the UBI dream, right? Like to actually bring it to life, um, especially with artificial intelligence. My question to you is, I never heard you talking about what did you do to actually keep US ahead of that AI development? Uh, and especially, how would you deal with China on that competition? Yeah. So for those of you who are into AI, um, the US and China are the two mega power leaders. Uh, and China is now poised to move ahead of us because they have more access to more data, which is like food for AI. And they also have an advantage that we do not have, which is they have a government that's willing to spend billions upon billions of dollars on limitless computing resource and infrastructure that they make available to their companies. I met with the leaders in AI in Silicon Valley not that long ago, and I said, hey guys, like, what's going on? And then they were like, hey, we're spending billions of dollars on uh, AI computing resources, but it's a small fraction of what China is spending. Uh, and so then I said, well, if I were president, would you like me to help with that? And they said, yes. So the plan <laughs> is for... <laughs> So, so the plan, so the, the ideal is to avoid an arms race dynamic um, because you don't want people like chasing after weaponized AI and, and thinking of it as a zero sum game. But in order to avoid that dynamic, the US needs to be one of the strongest com countries. Uh, and so in order to keep that leadership, uh, we would need to invest meaningful public resources because even our richest private companies cannot compete with Chinese computing resources. I'm just gonna tell a joke about AI because you know I, I thought it was funny. Um, how far up behind is China than the US in AI? And, and the, the joke is 12 hours. Uh, because <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> uh, so thank you all so much for being here today. I just wanna share something on the campaign. I'm poised to make the Democratic primary debates in June. Uh, and in order to make that happen, I need contributions from 65,000 individual Americans. And right now I'm at 50,000, I'm getting another 2,000 a day, so I'm gonna clear this threshold very, very easily. But if you'd like to be part of my making the debate stage, just make a donation at any point, and then, and then when I'm on the debate stage, you'll be like, hey, I helped make that happen. Uh, so thank you all very, very much. Would love to end this journey with you. Thank you.